I want to talk to you about the power of a deathbed confession. As a former homicide prosecutor and as an individual who was an EMT for many years, I have many opportunities to watch end of life experiences and the power that death can bring to our present life experiences and how we can live a life if we actually look at what death looks like. Now, I know it sounds strange, but let me give you a couple of examples on the philosophy of life that I've incorporated and spoke to so many people about, both in my legal career when I trained trial attorneys or as an anchor for a TV show or as a legal analyst on TV. And many lectures I've given around the world with regard to living a joyful and fulfilled life. I'd like to start with my mother. 18 years old, my young mom was walking down the street going to the beach with her friends when she was run over by a drunk driver. So brutally and horrifically physically injured, she was given her last rites and pronounced dead. My mom was placed in the morgue where there was an intern who was studying the process of rigor mortis and noticed that there were life signs. I'll make a long story short, they saved my mother, but when she came out on the other end and was now in a conscious state, her body was completely broken virtually every bone, her pelvis fractured in multiple places, and I've actually seen the x-rays of it. She was scarred both physically with massive scars on her face, as well as the emotional scars, probably of PTSD, that wasn't really discussed at that point in time. You had to do it on your own. And they told her some very limiting thoughts, the medical professionals. They told her she would never walk again, but she walked again a year later. They told her she would never have a child, but she wound up having two. Now, I was very sick as a young child, so I was in my mother's care and custody for many, many times when I was not in school, and I learned a lot of life lessons about her. And one of the things I learned was that she was not letting that experience define her. She would always say to me, that was an experience I dealt with. In fact, never really dwelled on it. It took me years to find out all of the things that she went through, despite the fact that her body was still in such a bad repair for her entire life. But she had the resiliency to say, that I am given a second chance and that every single day of your life in your present moment, Robert, you need to think about what does the end of your life look like? What do you want to say about the end of your life? Don't waste any experience. I've learned because I've been given a second chance. The other thing my mother told me was that there is no courage in the absence of fear. Now this became a very, very big thing for me in my career, both legally as a trial lawyer and as a media person who's in front of millions of people often. Don't have fear, you can't have courage. It took me a while to understand what that meant, but my mother was dealing with fear all the time because of her physical, emotional disabilities that she had, but she never backed away from any opportunity to make sure that she was not gonna let that fear define what the end of her life the second time would look like. My mother also taught me a very powerful lesson with respect to the idea that every single moment you have, lean into the present moment. It's not a macabre thing to think about your death, but lean into the present moment so that when you ultimately get to that space, can you say, life well lived? Those messages were given to me, whether it was breaking up with a girlfriend or having difficulty or fear that I would have about trying cases in so many ways, shapes, and forms. Now let's talk to you about my experience as an emergency medical technician. That was where I started to formulate some ideas that were really profound to me. In that environment, we dealt with people whose lives were taken away in a moment's notice, whether they were shot, whether they were stabbed. But what impressed me more were the individuals that we did transports for that had catastrophic long-term illnesses. Individuals going for cancer treatment or dialysis. You get to really know folks like individuals like that very clearly when you're in an ambulance transporting them there, waiting for them to have their treatment and transporting them back. And what struck me about that was when we would get our call slips for who we were to transport that day, there was one woman in particular, Mary Shaw, who I loved being with. She was positive, great energy, and despite the fact that she was failing month after month after month, she always spoke about how her life had meaning and how she had made a difference in every decision she had made in her life. Yet many of the other people, most I should say, did not have that experience. They lamented about how their lives didn't make a difference, how they were afraid and didn't do things, how limiting thoughts stopped them from achieving dreams, how people told them, defined for them, that they were not worthy 
And at the end of their life, their deathbed confession to a guy like me at 17 years old was, my life was completely meaningless. This was such a profound impact because it was so different than the mentality and mindset of my mother that I promised at that point in time, I would never live a life where I would be saying that I had such regrets for at least not having tried and at least dared to try to do something, whether I failed in it or whether I was successful in it. This was something that was going to carry through with me in many instances in my life where people told me I couldn't do things, where I told myself I couldn't do things, but I refused to be the person that was going to do my deathbed confession like so many that I had spoken to and say that I regretted not having done something in my life. Let me tell you a little bit about the summations. Summations in a trial are a very interesting thing. A summation happens at the end of the case, and it's based upon all the evidence that was produced and adduced during the course of the trial. You cannot com comment on summation about anything that did not occur during the trial itself. My father, a great and prolific trial lawyer, taught me early on that when you have a case and you have the file, the first thing you think about is what your summation is going to be. What do you want to say to the jury at the conclusion of the case? Just like what do you want to say about yourself at the conclusion of your life? We'll tie that in in a minute. But as a trial lawyer, it helped me and served me very well and made me a very successful trial lawyer because I knew what I wanted to be able to say to the jury at the end of the case. And then I built the evidence as I went backwards into the present moment to make sure I had the right witnesses, the right evidence, the right building blocks so that I would be able to give that summation or deathbed confession at the end of the trial to the jury in a competent way. It informed my present moment by thinking what the end would look like. There was a professor in my college. He was a person that many of the students never wanted to talk to. He was brilliant. Everybody knew he was brilliant. He was the head resident for all of the students, but he was quirky and he was odd, or at least that's how he was perceived. This was an individual that would talk to squirrels. When he would sit in the cafeteria, he sat by himself with three empty chairs, and I would watch him eat food, and he would smack his lips, and he seemed to be pondering something. And I would say to myself, I wonder what great theory he's thinking about. I wonder what great philosophical principle he's thinking about. But I had the courage to do something many of the students didn't do, and that is to go down and sit down with him when nobody else would and ask him what he was thinking. And in one pivotal moment, I learned a lot about this man who I claim to probably be the wisest man I've ever met in my life. And he was eating a piece of quiche, a simple, ordinary thing, not thinking a life lesson was going to come from it. As he was smacking his lips and he was tasting, you could see that he was thinking as he rolled his eyes upwards. And he started to explain to me every single ingredient that was inside of that quiche. He described the texture of it. As he smacked his lips, he talked about the people that actually make it and the miracle of the people making it. He told me he had a tough day that day. He had a lot to do with regard to the students that he had to teach, and he had a lot to do with his administrative responsibilities. But he said, now is the time, Bob. Now is the time for me to be able to lean into this particular thing because it's so beautiful, not just to consume it, but to understand it, to appreciate it on a level that so many other people don't do. And he got up and he walked away. And I thought about that concept very much like my mother would say to me, lean into those moments when things are bad, when you're uncomfortable, when people are telling you you can't do things, there are things to be grateful for, things that you can really look at if you pay attention to the particulars as opposed to the thoughts and negative toxic thinking that's going on inside of your mind. Living that experience with Professor Heath Professor Heath once told me that his deathbed confession was after he had watched the bombs drop at Nagasaki in Hiroshima. He was a naval commander, and he made a promise at that point in time in his life that what he wanted to accomplish at the end was that he knew he could never change one person completely, but if he could bring a little bit of goodness to a person, a little bit of an understanding of the importance of giving to other people, when all those little pieces added up to one human being, then he wanted his life to be taken. Couldn't help but think when he ultimately died that not only did he do those many pieces in me, but all of them added up to that one person that he was looking to change. These are very profound thinkers and very profound thoughts that ultimately led me to the idea that I do not want to be now my age inside of an ambulance with a 17-year-old, talking to them about all the things that I should have done, I could have done, the things I feared to do, 
So my deathbed confession, while it's not mapped out chapter and verse each moment, is when somebody tells me a limiting thought, when somebody tells me no, when somebody tells me I can't do it, that I am going to do it. And if I don't do it, at least I dared greatly, even if I fail in doing that. Last point is when I became a young lawyer, lots of people look at me and they say, you're a great trial lawyer. You've gotten all the big cases. You ultimately got appointed by the governor to be the chief law enforcement officer of a county. You got on TV. You're a host of a TV network. Wow, you must be special. There's nothing special about it. The specialty of what occurred was because through the lives of my mother and through Professor Heath and my father and the, one of the women on the ambulance who I love so much, Mary Shaw, their experiences, their positivity, they're explaining to me that at the end, your deathbed confession is so important to form right now, no time to lose, right now, so that when the static happens, the toxicity happens, the negativity happens, the doubt happens, you could say to yourself, I am not going to be on my deathbed saying that I regret it, that this great gift that's been given to us had been wasted. I wish to you a great deathbed confession.